Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Broncos. I am sitting here with my good friend and co-host, Zach Seegers. Zach, how are you doing today, man? I am doing pretty well, pretty well. Excited to be back. Uh, don't know if I'm back for good, but excited to be back for this show, filling in for Bree. Uh, I miss talking Broncos with all our uh, uh, lovely crew. So uh, no, you're, you're enjoying buffs over there. You're enjoying buffs over there. Do not <laughs> lie. That's what. That's. I mean, if you want to know why he left, <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> yep. No, I, I, I just I had to. I had, sorry, guys. I had bigger fish to fry. <laughs> No, um, I've, I've been dealing with some family stuff. I've talked about that in the Discord. Um, I might talk about that more at a later date. But, uh, yeah, uh, happy to be back talking Broncos with y'all. Hello, Paul. Uh, hey, Cal. Missed uh, both of you guys. For sure. Um, well, we have a good episode ahead of us today, Zach. We have a really good episode. Zach came up with a really fun game for us to do. To- go through it. It's not just like one of those regular games. It's going to bring actually really good Broncos conversation involved with it. So I'm excited for that. Um, But first, first, Zach, we have a breakdown from one of the best film X and O guys in the entire business, not just Broncos country. I'm going to say the entire business because I actually do believe that Um, Robbie is going to show us and he was nice enough to send us a little clip um, with different examples of what Sean Payton's going to bring to the Broncos. Um, And I'm going to play that real quick, and then we can discuss it after. What's going on, everybody? It's Robbie here. And as we all know, the Broncos have traded for and hired New Orleans Saints head coach Sean Payton. And I'm going to be doing sort of, for lack of a better term, a series on his offense for you guys. Uh, I'll be breaking down his third down packages, his red zone, short yardage, anything like that. I'll be doing a deep study on it during the offseason and providing you guys with some videos breaking it down. And what I have today is an example of an opening script giving Sean Payton something to come back to later on in the game for a big play. So as you see here, the Saints are in 11 personnel. They're in a 2x2 two by, two by two set, which you're going to get a motion over, and it's going to be a little boundary toss, a boundary same side toss. And what they're going to get here is Sean Payton's going to be looking over on the sideline for anything that he can key in on and come back to later in the game. And what's going to happen is the middle of the field safety is going to trigger on the toss super aggressively. Like as soon as the ball is snapped and the ball goes to the running back, he's just setting off and he's going to come down into the fit for it. He's going to see that Sean Payton is going to see that and he's going to come back to it. So I'll let it play here. And as soon as that ball was snapped and the ball was given to the running back, I believe it is Andrew Sendejo. Don't hold me to it. I'm just going off of the number here. I didn't really look into the personnel that was on the field in the film. But yeah, Andrew Sendejo triggers super aggressively on the play, comes down to try and make the tackle. Sean Payton sees that, and he's going to come back to it later for a big play. Okay, so here's the second play, the constraint play off of the first play. This is in the third quarter, third around midfield. The first play was during the opening script. So one of the plays that they called on the opening script in the first quarter, they're coming back with a constraint play off of it in the third quarter for a big play. So the first play, they were in gun, and this time they're in under center. But they're going to get to the same look that they had because this boundary wide receiver is going to motion in off the line of scrimmage he's going to be he's going to go from the one to the two and this is going to be the same staggered or stacked alignment that the defense saw on the first play that i showed and they're going to get to the same exact toss action here as soon as breeze opens up his drop and goes to toss the ball the middle of the field safety is going to trigger aggressively the same exact way that they saw that he did from the first play and when this happens the Z receiver out here to the field is going to run a double move. So he's going to start vertical. He's going to stop like he's going out. And then he's just going to go right down the field. And because this safety, the middle of the field safety triggered so aggressively, he's taking himself out of the play. And it's going to be a huge play for the offense. You're going to see the motion and then watch the middle of the field safety. He triggers immediately. That one step gets him completely out of place for a big play. And this is an example of what they are looking for on the opening script and how they can come back to it and create an explosive play off of it. 
man. Oh, man. Shout out to Robbie. Um, shout out to Robbie. Robbie underscore NFL is his at. Make sure you're going to follow him. His breakdowns are ridiculously good, and that his tweets are also ridiculously good. If you're not following him, I don't know what you're doing. Um, especially if you're in Broncos country, like I'm speaking for all NFL fans, but especially Broncos country, he is a staple. So make sure you're following him. As far as that breakdown goes, and I want your opinion on this, Zach, this is why you trade a first round pick for Sean Payton, right? This is why you're doing that. If you're able to have an X and O advantage every single week, he got one look and then had another play off of that, which gave him, what was that? Like a 40 yard gain? Like a 40-yard gain. How many 40-yard gains did you see the Broncos get easily this year? It wasn't much. It wasn't much. Um, so if you get that advantage week in and week out from a head coach, it's going to make the world's difference. I really believe that. So, But, Zach, I want your opinion on um, the breakdown we just saw from Robbie there. Yeah, I don't have the year on that. I think that's 2021, though, um, I believe. So you're looking at the most recent version of Sean Payton – um, and the most recent version of Drew Brees, and I think that's important to keep in mind. But to your point, yeah, that's what you're finally getting this Broncos country. You're finally <laughs> getting it. And I think last year there was all the hype, obviously, around Russell Wilson. And it was like, yeah, but I think the big concern that everyone highlighted, and of course it ended up going like the worst possible way, was yeah, but the staff's so inexperienced. Like no one has any experience in their current position. What's going to happen there? And it was the worst possible outcome. It was an utter disaster. Um, you know, you could have looked at the Green Bay stuff and gone like, oh, well, maybe Hackett's responsible for this. Maybe Alton's responsible for some of this game planning. Reportedly, Hackett was doing their red zone play calling, and they had the best red zone offense in NFL history, so we can get excited about that, yada, yada. There's no debate about that with that play right there or with that play calling right there. It's like we don't have to wonder – are the Broncos getting that, or was that uh, Mike Lafleur or Matt Lafleur rather, um, or was that you know whoever else, Adam Stenovich? Um, we know that is a Sean Payton product, and um, just yeah, so excited to see that come to fruition. Uh, I think the one question mark, the one asterisk to you know what you're getting is well, do you know what you're getting with the quarterback? And while I think that question does linger, and I am concerned about what Russell Wilson is moving forward. Um, I don't think Drew Brees was that great at that point in his career. And Sean Payton was still able to create awesome looks like that, that Drew Brees could take advantage of. Drew Brees did not have an explosive arm at that point in your, at that point in his career. And to Joey's point, that was a very explosive play. Yes. Yes. And if you could get explosive plays that are easier like that, right. Um, that wasn't a throw that NFL quarterbacks should be making that throw. They absolutely should be making that throw. That was a 40-yard gain off of um, play design. That's what that was. Because if you don't have a quarterback that's making that throw, you need a new quarterback. That's that's what's uh, telling you. Or it was just a really bad throw. It, that At the end of the day, that's what it was. Um, so, you know, just identifying something on one play and then using that against them on the next. That, fantastic, fantastic. And shout out to Robbie for um, – bring that to us uh, again make sure you're following him at robbie davis if you're listening on the twitter right now make sure you go to the mile high sports youtube right now where you can go um communicate with us we have a bunch of comments in the chat right now colton is excited to see you zach he said zach let's go uh, paul says we got a 40 yard gain in 40 plays <laughs> you know the, the, so Awesome. Everyone, please make sure you're coming over to the YouTube. But without further ado, let's move on to the game. Zach came up with this really fun game, and I think it's going to bring us really um, fun content as well. We're going to be able to talk about it and discuss it. And yeah, can you explain the game for us, Zach? Yeah, absolutely. A uh, little what's more likely credit to the Around the NFL podcast. Uh, one of the first NFL podcasts I started listening to and like freshman year of high school or something like that, right after the Broncos Super Bowl lost to the Seahawks. And they have a great game, uh, very simplistic, called What's More Likely? And it's exactly what it sounds like. Uh, we will throw out two hypothetical propositions to each other um, and uh, then debate which is more likely. Um, I, I can go first just to give us the hang of the game here. Please do, uh, please do. 
<laughs> yeah. What is the little tip of the hat here to Mario, who tweeted out yesterday, uh, a big name Bronco could be on the trading uh, block. Um, who is more likely to be traded this upcoming season, Garrett Bowles or Cortland Sutton? Okay. It's a good question, Zach. I like it. I like it. My answer to this is Garrett Bowles, and I'll tell you why. With the news coming out saying that Garrett Bowles um, is a trade candidate for the Broncos, it indicates to me that they would cut him anyways. They're due him a lot of money in the future. I don't think they want to pay him that money. I think that they would cut him anyways. So my thing here is that they're going to take what they get for him. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't think it's a good idea, but that's just what that indicates to me. That I don't know if you have any difference opinion there. I personally wouldn't do anything with Garrett Bulls. The Broncos offensive line has been a massive issue this entire this entire last season, and it's been the number one priority this offseason. Opening another hole at the left tackle position isn't something that sounds great going into an offseason where – we feel like we have to upgrade at both right tackle and left tackle. Not ideal. You know, Seattle wasn't, isn't the plan. They, they got really lucky nailing two rookie tackles right there. That looked pretty good for the season. That isn't and should not be expected. That absolutely should not. Um, so I am worried about it. I would not get rid of Garrett Bulls, especially if Sean Payton expects to come into the season and win. If the Broncos are a win now team, Getting rid of Garrett Bowles doesn't make much sense, especially considering um, that I don't think they're going to get much back for him. So yet, do you agree with me? Yeah, you still think they're going to uh, trade him? I do think. I think that the fact that they are offering him for a trade, I just don't see the Broncos getting a ton back, Zach. That's my thing. So that indicates to me that they'd cut him anyways. That's, that's what that tells me. Like the fact that you're going to get – I mean, what do you think they get back for Garrett Bowles? I think they should be able to get something, and and I I think you're on the right track. One note I had, um, shoot, I might it might take me a second to find the proper name here. There was a Giants offensive lineman who in 2021 uh, suffered a leg fracture like Garrett Bowles. Um, it took him uh, much longer to recover. Here, let me see if I have it handy. I don't. Dang, I thought I screenshotted it. Um, <laughs> uh, well, there was a Giants offensive lineman. He took 13 months to get back. So that would get Garrett Bulls back around like week nine, halfway through the season. And you're paying him $18 million this year and then 20 next year. And he was already showing some pretty severe signs of decline. I do think it makes sense to kind of cut bait now and get what you can for him. Um, you'd be saving... So do, do you think that's what they do, Zach, or do you think that's what they should do? I I don't know. And I'll tell you the uh, this, to your point about shopping Garrett Bulls and like, well, it's very clear to me they're shopping him. They might even be open to cutting him, but that doesn't make sense for like trying to win games now with Sean Payton. I think the right. Broncos are smart enough to know that. Like it makes me wonder – how all in they truly are on 2023. And good point. I think them not being all in on 2023, that's probably not an exciting thing to hear if you're a Bronco fan, like, oh, they're not all in for the upcoming season. But I think it's a good thing um, in the long run. I understand the desire, like, well, you got to be all in to figure out whether or not it's right with Russ. And I, I see the merit in that argument. But I also think like the writing's pretty on the wall there. And now that you have Sean Payton, you you have the guy that can oversee. Like you thought you were getting it with Russell Wilson. That didn't work out. But now you have it with Sean Payton. You have the guy that can create offensive sustainability and a good franchise uh, vision and direction for the next uh, decade plus, hopefully, fingers crossed. But, you know, at least five plus years. Um And uh, I, I think that's bigger than this upcoming season. So seeing these signs that maybe it's not – 2023 or bust because guess what 2023 or bust comes with a bust if things don't work out i think that maybe playing things a little safer a little more conservative is a good sign um what's more likely i'm with you i think it's garrett bulls but i wouldn't sleep on the Cortland sutton trade um 
I thought it was more impossible than it was. I don't know if the numbers have gotten updated on this or um, if I was just reading it wrong this whole time. I thought it was like impossible to get out of it um, and, and they were still going to lose money. I was just checking. They would actually save um, on the trade. On the cut, they would lose money. They can't cut him. But on a pre-June 1st trade, um, they would save uh, $6.8 million. Mm. Um, now, uh, that's net. They're uh, losing. So in total, they're freeing up, what, about $18 million, but a, a little over 18.1. But 11.5 of that is dead money. Um, so then you're still left with some savings uh, and whatnot, but it's just, it's a little less attractive. What are you getting for Cortland Sutton at this point to your Garrett Bowles point? Um, cutting Garrett Bowles just seems a little more with your weight, but it's easier to find wide receivers than tackles. And if Michael Thomas is out with new Orleans, that's a very easy replacement for Cortland Sutton. Like maybe you swing thing, swing something there. I don't think it's like, Garrett Bowles is ahead by a mile. I could see either getting moved. So we both agree that Garrett Bowles um, is more likely, but who do you think nets most? If you were the trade him, who do you think gets a higher pick? Oh, man. It's a tough one. No, I I agree with you. After the trade – Because we have Corlin Sun, who's coming off not so, – and I'm just going to lay it out real quick. We have Corlin Sun not coming off the best season of his career. Um, I think there are some that are worried about if he will ever get back to the same explosiveness that he once was before his injury. And now with Garrett Bowles, we're wondering, you know, there was a little bit of a regression after the Mike Munchak fire. Um, and then also he is coming off a season ending injury. So th- th- that's why it's a little confusing, but back to you, Zach. Yeah. I thought that was well put Joey. Um, imagine you're the average NFL GM, average NFL team, little throwback to what's on draft here with the two of us, but pretend you're the average NFL GM or NFL team. What would you prefer a 31 year old Garrett Bowles who plays left tackle valuable position um, costing you $9.8 million um, against the cap at 31 years old, you know, showed some signs of decline without Mike Munchak. Um, or Corlin Sutton, who's also showing signs of decline post ACL, but is age 28 and would only cost uh, $6.8 million. Um, and you consider what wide receivers are making nowadays. Corlin Sutton might net more. When you look at it like yeah. that, Maybe Sutton is more likely to be traded Um, because I can talk myself into offering a fourth or a fifth for Sutton a lot easier than I can for Bulls. And if the Broncos are really just looking to recoup draft capital, you know, like that's the end all be all. Um, I don't know. Maybe it is Sutton. Okay, so this is where we disagree. I would say Bulls. And here's the reason why. You might not be getting them until week nine, though. I, I okay, that is serious. that's spooky. I didn't realize that you might not be. Okay, I would have to know where he stands. Let, let's let's work let's work under that he's ready for the that we think that he could be ready for week one just because it's more of a fun conversation. Okay, um, okay, I think that with the positional value included. Now, I was talking to Frankie. We have a podcast every Thursday. Please go listen um, <laughs> about this today. There is it's so rare that you're able to find a good tackle in free agency. If there is a really good slam dunk tackle, there's like one, that's it. Everybody else you're taking a swing on, whether it be small or a big swing, you're taking a swing with how big, how much um, these guys are getting demanded to pay. Like you're just not finding them. You're not finding them. Wide receivers. We've talked about it before here on this uh, podcast, Zach, you can, you can find them. You can find good wide receivers later in the draft. Elite ones, probably not, but there are a ton of good wide receivers in every single draft. Tackles have to draft them early. They're never available in free agency. I think a team would take a swing on Garrett Bulls just off his past. 
honestly, because what I other options that. do teams have? That That's kind of my get that, take but there. It's, it, You don't know what he's going to look like. He was already looking a little sketchy. He's age 31. Like, I, I think I might go with Bulls, but I don't know. It's $11 million. And then if you feel like you made a good deal and you decide to keep the guy for the next year, then you're on the hook for his $20 million cap hit. Um, while Sutton, you get him for, what is it, seven this year? And then you know, the next two years are uh, 17 and 17, um, which is tough. Uh, the nice thing with both Bulls and Sutton to whatever team acquires them, uh, they won't be tied to them at all. There will be zero dead money they could – cut them and move on from them whenever. Um, yeah, or actually, that's not true with Sutton. There's some other guarantees on that contract that the Broncos won't be on the hook for. Um, so that's another, actually, angle to this. When I consider Sutton's contract, it'll be hard for whatever team acquires him to cut him still. Um, uh, not as hard as it would be for the Broncos, too, but it will still be somewhat difficult. So, uh, yeah, I think I, I still lean on the bull side. But I do think it's at least a, a tight combo. What's your first one, Joey? It is. So, okay, here's my first one. Um, and thank you for leading me to it. Uh, my first one is what's more likely, Zach? Russell Wilson gets benched next year. And when I talk about bench, I'm talking about midseason. We're not playing him again. You know, that that's the type of bench that I'm talking about. Um, we're moving on, type benching. Or he's a top eight quarterback. What do you think is more likely there? I think it's probably more likely he gets benched mm. um, just because we've already seen like I, and I, I want to make sure it's not my, you know, Russell Wilson takes and maybe my preconceived notions or biases leading me there, but okay. Let me look at um Steven Ruiz's rankings at like in general. And, you know, these aren't the end all be all. I think he does a good job with it, but I'll list off like the top 10. And we can, you know, because maybe people disagree on who the top eight is, but we can get a general idea. Pick your own top eight out of these guys, but it's just a general list. Patrick Mahomes, Justin Herbert, Joe Burrow, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson, Dak Prescott, Trevor Lawrence, Aaron Rodgers, Jalen Hurts. Um, and then, yeah, because Tom Brady's not in the league. So that's just nine. I, I think it's possible Russ could get there, but I think he's like scraping seven or eight. And I think that's the ceiling. I've talked about it a million times on this show, so I don't want to have the same like lecture again, but just with how <laughs> it's evolved away from his strengths and how he's become a limited quarterback. While I do think you can maximize what version of Russell Wilson we have now, I do think we have to acknowledge that like there is a hard ceiling on it. it he's not going to, I think you could put him in the like perfect situation and you're not getting like, a top three quarterback performance out of him just because he does have certain limitations. If the defense asks him to do certain things, he's going to struggle with them. Um, maybe like uh, there, he could have a just extreme transformation this upcoming season where he shows quick game. That's not a problem for me. Short to intermediate center of the field. That's not a problem for me. And those limitations are broken and maybe he does become super elite and I look like an idiot but he's played in the NFL for 11 years and we've seen uh, zero signs of that. So I'm going to bet on the status quo maintaining there. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's so far hard for him to reach that seven, eight mark. Meanwhile, on the benching front, I expect the Denver Broncos. I expect, I will be mildly surprised if they don't do this. I expect the Denver Broncos to bring in a actual other quarterback option as in not a Brett Rippon. I don't know if it's a fourth round draft pick or a fifth round draft pick, someone that's just respectable. Um, or, you know, like, you know, a Sam Howell was for Washington this past season. I could also see it being a, uh, a free agent signing. Um, I could pull up the veteran list in a second, but I think they'll have a legit, There's some guys out there. Totally. I think they'll have a legit option. And I think now the Broncos have empowered a person to be able to bench Russ I don't know if Sean Payton wants to bench Russ, but I think Sean Payton is at least empowered to if he wants to. Um, I don't think Nathaniel Hackett would have had that power necessarily. It would have been real uncomfortable. Or the backbone. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, or the backbone for real. Um, but you know what I mean? Like it just would have always been impossible with Hackett for a million different reasons. Now with Sean Payton, year two of Russ after year one being disastrous, I think that's more likely. 
Um, that's actually the only one I could see. No, I could see both happening. I think they both have a decent chance of happening. It's, so but, it's both decent, Zach, because I think the most likely, and it's not an option in this, and this is why I ask it, is that he falls more in between that 12 to 16 range. That's that's the way I look at it. 12 to maybe even um, – Eight, 10 to 18, if I want to put it broad. That's the way I see it more so going. Um, if I were to pick more likely, though, I'm going to say top eight, Zach. I'm going to have to go top eight. I'm going to have to disagree with you there just because I think it would be really – and this is the final line. Like all evaluation mm -hmm. aside, um, I think that it's more likely that the Broncos – don't bench him. They're going to have to get a look at him before they make any moves. They're going to want a clean cut move vision of what Russell Wilson brings this team. You know that, that. So I doubt they bench him. I doubt it. Now I completely think you're right, Zach, that they do have Tom Hayden is more empowered to do so. I just don't think that it will happen. I don't think he will want to. I think that if the Broncos start losing, you, you get a higher draft pick if, and you're going to have a clear picture on if you need to move on from Russ, if they are winning great. I just don't see the benching part. I just don't see that. I I disagree. I think there there's totally reason um, for the bench, and, and here's actually why. Um, now I'm a cap novice. I'm learning more about this stuff, but there are stipulations in Russ's deal about how many games he starts this season that opens them up for getting out of it after the year. So if it's looking bad, the Broncos will be motivated to sit Russell Wilson to wow. make it easier to cut him in the off season. I don't know the exact stipulations. I could look it up here in a second, maybe and scan the article. Um, go check out Spotrax, you know, where are the Russell Wilson exits article and look at their section about the 2024 exit. I know they talk about it. There's something about him missing games maybe it's due to injury or something but that's something where you can go oh he's got a strained calf he has to miss five weeks you know and it's a little nut, wink wink nut <laughs> nut but um uh, uh the bronco I, I i just they're going to be if things start going bad they will be financially motivated to bench him rather than just leave him in there um and i also think sean payton's the type of hard ass where even if that wasn't incentive there he might just be uh wanting to throw him out um the top eight thing is just so tough for me because like a top eight quarterback last year is aaron Rodgers, trevor lawrence Dak prescott on the outer end of that range Russell Wilson getting up there feels very, very hard for me to see right now. I, I understand that. I get your point. Um, just two different perspectives there, I think. I, it just how well, – at the end of the day, I don't even think – I think we both agree, um, just to cap this off, I think Zach and I both agree here that Russell Wilson will probably fall into a middling – type quarterback range. I expect the Broncos roster to be better than it was last year um, with all the injuries and stuff like that. The Broncos had it's the, the middling part is where I think they will fall. It's just what's more likely these two extremes. So that that's, that's, that's the disagreement. Um, but Zach, can you lay out your next, um, your next one for me? Absolutely. One thing I wanted to really add quick there. Uh, I think the extremes are what you want to root for if you're a Broncos fan this year. The, yes. Him looking like Absolutely. a top eight quarterback is obvious, but if he's just really bad, okay, this sucks. The Broncos made a mistake, but now we know for certain it's a mistake and you can move on. You're not the Bears starting Mitch Trubisky for four <laughs> seasons, three seasons and, or whatever. You're not um, – uh, uh, I'm trying to think of like another like Blake the Jags with Blake Bortles for four or five years and then being like, is he? I think he might. He kind of looks like the guy. Sometimes let's just give him like a mid-level extension and then he signs the extension. You're like, oh, what a nightmare. Uh, <laughs> it, it's nice to just kind of get that clarity on it one way or the other, so your franchise can strongly move in one direction, um, mm -hmm. either embracing Russ or moving off of Russ. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I would root for the extremes, which is unfortunate because I think we both agree that the extremes are a little less likely here. Um, yeah. My next one, uh, 
I, I had a last minute audible. We were doing some pre-show planning and I told Joey it was going to okay. be. Okay. All right. And I'm ready. I realized I'm, I'd be doubling up on the <laughs> button. So I changed it to uh, capture our graphic here. Um, what's more likely? Jerry Judy hits 1,400 okay. receiving yards. All right. Or Javante Williams hits 1,000 rushing yards now for the sake of context wrap your head around this uh in 2022 16 running backs reached a thousand rushing yards so i'm saying he's the top half of the league starter just about um what is it five receivers reached that 1450 number so i'm saying jerry judy's producing like a top five wide receiver but i think given having a mediocre quarterback even with Sean Payton, you know, given his injury history as well, that's a little dicey. But Javante Williams is coming off one of the most devastating knee injuries we've ever, or maybe not ever seen, but seen in the last decade of NFL football. Um, so 900,000 yards, even if it's just saying top half of the uh, NFL starter, I think that's pretty uh, tough to Joey. What say you? What's more likely? All right. I'm going to go Judy, and I'll give you a couple of reasons why, Zach. One, we you laid out the injury. That's a perfect point for against Javante Williams reaching 1,000 yards. I want to add on to that and just say, hey, I doubt Javante Williams will even have the opportunity to get 1,000 yards. Or if he does, he's going to have to be playing out of his mind. Sean Payton is going to do a running back by committee. Javante Williams will still be a big part of the offense if he does look really good. It's just, is he going to get the touches to even, like, he's going to have to have a really good season to get 1,000. That That's kind of my argument against that. Now, for Judy, I'm looking at it like, hey, this guy finished the season last year really, really strong with working through Nathaniel Hackett and then Justin Otten, um, who I have posted many memes about on my Twitter <laughs> It's just like, I don't know. I, I think he finished extremely strong. Javante Williams didn't play at the end of the season. I look at the head coach you just brought in, who's benefiting there. I would say even if Javante had full workload this entire last season, I'm going to would say stats-wise probably a little back just off how I think the offense is going to be ran. Um, Jerry Judy, I think Russell Wilson will look better this next season than he did this season. And he already looked good. It's just consistency for him. So I would say what's more likely, Jerry Judy. That, that's my answer. What about you, Zach? Okay. Well, what is your what is your answer there? It's tough. I think I'd also go Jerry Judy. It's just, I don't know. I want it, I want my answer to be Javante Williams. Because it's sad. If I came to you. Even if you knew Jerry Judy would have the close to the season he would have, but like if you just remove Javante Williams' injury from this, let's just that maybe that's the easier way to frame it. Remove Javante Williams' injury from the picture. If I tell you what's more likely, Javante Williams is one of the 16 best running backs, or Jerry Judy is one of the five best wide receivers, I bet on Javante Williams being the 16, one of the 16 best running backs. It is entirely and I'm with you. I, I don't know if this one's even that close. I, I would also go with Judy. I thought I think you laid out a really good case about how the second way you framed it made it interesting, though. I do have to say that because I do agree with you, Zach. That if you were to just say, "Hey, who has the better odds at being top five of their position?" and Javante Williams didn't have that injury, I'm voting Javante. His his progression was it's sad, clearer. Man. It's yeah. it's heartbreaking. That was the worst moment of the season to me. I think even worse than Russ being bad. And Russ being bad might have been more like that is leading to the franchise and everything. Like that sucks. I mean, really wanted to wear. Those are the two uh, biggest heartbreaks of the season to me. Like, but man, when Javante got injured, I uh, I love. He was maybe my favorite Bronco, and I I really, if I'm being honest, I kind of don't think we're ever going to get Javante Williams again. I, I hate to Ooh. say it. I hate to say it, but that makes, that makes I don't I not to say we won't ever see him again, but I think we might see him and maybe it's like 2022 Zeke Elliott, where it's just like it's just it's not the same. And 
that would make me really sad. Um, that's why I'm very sad about the Javante Williams situation. I hope I'm wrong. I really hope I'm wrong. I'm just telling the people what I'm seeing here. Really hope I'm wrong. Uh, but yeah, I if that injury wasn't a thing, I think it'd be Javante Williams by a landslide because of the injury. Who knows when he's back? He could be back week four, and then we're talking about a thousand yards off injury in you know, 13 weeks or in 12 games or whatever, that's going to be really hard for anyone to accomplish. Um, So I, I, uh, I'll go with Judy too, though it would require him to be elite. Good thing is we saw the symptoms of that. He finished the season as a top 11 receiver in terms of yards per route run, getting to top five, isn't that massive of a leap. Now that would also require him to play 17 games. That's probably the bigger hurdle. But we saw that leap in efficiency already in a very inefficient passing offense. In, a, in, a, in that horrible offense, he was 11th in yards per route run. Imagine if Sean Payton boosts this to being like the 18th best offense. Maybe he could go from 11 to 5. And if he stays healthy, then he's right there. So I'd go with Judy too. Okay. Well, we both agree on that one. This one I'm interested about. Zach, who is more likely to be the Broncos' best edge? The best edge rusher on the team. Baron Browning or Randy Gregory? We're including injuries in this. You know, Randy has been beat up a little bit, um, but all world talent. We saw it but even at the beginning of this year. He was one of the best Broncos defenders when he was on the field. Um, compared to Baron Browning, who I think is still improving at his position, um, moving from inside linebacker to edge. Who, who do you think is better there? To me, this is like what's more likely, Randy Gregory stays healthy or Baron Browning makes a big leap. And when you train it like that, I've got to go with Baron Brownie making a big leap. Uh, if you were to say, like, you know, remove injury from it, who's better on a per game basis? Who's better on the field? When on the field, I think I go Randy Gregory still. Um, I, I think Baron Brownie will take a leap, but I do think there's a size, excuse me, there, I do think there's a sizable gap there. I like Randy Gregory early in the season, I think it's easy to forget about now, but he looked like a top five kind of defensive player in the league to me. Like he looked, he was balling out of his, out of his day on mind. I loved what we saw from him and it sucked how the whole injury thing went. I do think he probably could have come back and contributed and and played well down the stretch. um, If the team was competing and contending still. Um, But yeah, it's, it's what's more likely Randy Gregory stays healthy for an entire year or um, Brownie makes a big leap. And because of what we've seen from Gregory in his career, um, and then the development where what we saw Baron Browning produce, given, you know, having still kind of a weird COVID issue, or I guess no, 2022 is back to normal, but having a new coaching staff coming in, learning a new position and everything, um, and then just being wildly impressive, really from the jump. Um, uh, and, and then, you know, people thought he'd just get to be a spot player. Instead, he had to be a starter. And, you know, once Randy Gregory went down, he had to be the number one pass rushing option on this team. Um, I think it's a lot more likely he makes a developmental leap uh, than it is that Grand, R- R- Randy Gregory stays healthy for an entire year. So we disagree here again, Zach. And here's my main issue with this is that, it's not that I don't think Baron Browning will take that leap because I think I do think it's possible. I do think it's possible. I really do. Um, some of his pass rushing reps look elite. When you just break down the highlights, if you were to just throw the Baron Browning highlights on, you would think that the man is the best he's edge rusher in the NFL. You would think he's – yes, his highlights are unbelievable. It's just about making that more consistent, right? Um, and he is. I will say he's only been at this position for one year. What does he look like in year two at this position? It, it's you know it's 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 something that could be work out really awesome for the Broncos. My thing here, Zach, is that we've already seen it from Randy Gregory. We've already seen it. We've seen it. Randy Gregory has been elite. There's a chance that Randy Gregory plays 11 games. This is still the best Broncos edge rusher in this room. And when we look back at it at the end of the season, he could miss games and still be the Broncos' best. That That's a possibility. It really is. He is that good. When he's on the field, um, 
he can win in so many different ways. He can win with his length, power, right? Um, long arms, bull rushes, all that different ways. He can also win with his athleticism. He could just beat people off the snap. He can win in a th- many different ways. Randy Gregory is unbelievable, um, and we've seen it. We've seen it from him before, so that's why I kind of lean Randy Gregory that way. I need to see it before I believe it with uh, with Baron Browning. Um, yeah, that, that's just kind of my take there. Do you have any? thing to add on to that no I, I think you make good points but for me i'm like i guess i'm seeing those high-end flashes of baron browning in one season of edge and i'm like good coaching a little more stability around him a little more help from the offense a little more playing with a lead i think you can piece that into something really really special and then on the randy gregory side He's played a lot of NFL seasons, and the weed thing's been a concern. Yeah, whatever. That's not a problem anymore. You know, the NFL changed the rules. Um, but the, the, the injury stuff has been a consistent issue, and I don't yeah. think that has gone away. And and so I, I I hear you. I'm a big Randy Gregory fan, so I, I have a hard time disagreeing with you, but I, I do think I fall on the, the Baron Browning side of things. Okay. Well, okay. We'll agree to disagree there, Zach. Um, you know what we can agree on, though? We could definitely agree on this one. The oldest brewery in the world, Wine Stefan. Who Come cannot on. agree on Wine Stefan? <laughs> it's, it's literally my favorite beer. There's nothing better, specifically the Hefeweiss beer. Um, if you're a Hef styled beer fan in the chat, there's not a better one. There isn't a better one. It's the They're benchmark of the wheat style beer and it's the number one selling german wheat beer in the entire united states you would be not smart drinking this one the germans know their beer there's one thing they know it's their beer and this is the oldest one add those two up you have a fantastic brewery (laughs) what was that zach i said ever heard of oktoberfest that which brings me to another point. Their Fest beer is fantastic. That's matter of fact, that's my favorite beer from Wine Stefan. It's amazing. Their Fest beer is my favorite, and it only comes out during that time. So uh, make sure you're grabbing that when that rolls around next year. You might still be able to find some. I know I loaded up. I still have some. And to prove it, I will bring one on this podcast next episode. Uh, <laughs> but it's a 54 percent beer so you can crush these things it's not going to get you super drunk if you drink a f- couple of them um of course drink responsibly but wine seven is amazing it's literally my favorite beer i love it yeah i'm with them <laughs> i it's my favorite beer i don't drink a lot of beer i don't know the different types of beers you know i, I can't i know like lager ipa or whatever i don't personally recognize the type that uh, wine Stefan is Hefe or whatever. I've already forgotten. The Hefe, yeah, the Hefe, Hefe Weiss okay, beer. I did get it right. The Hefe so, Weiss beer. Hefe Weiss beer. So like, I'm not familiar with that. Try it. Try new things. Yeah, if, no. if you can drink the beer, you are 21 years of age. That means you're not a child anymore. Don't be afraid of broccoli. Don't be afraid of new things. Try well, don't be things. that. Don't be that dude that turns 18 and you're still eating the dinosaur chicken nuggets. Is what Zach's Very pretty much well, saying right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but let's get, let, let's get back into the conversation, Zach. Is it my turn or your turn? It is my turn for our okay. rapid so fire. Zach, I'm going to present this real quick. This one's a little more rapid fire. We'll have a little conversation about it. Um, but, Zach, what is, what's is what's your question? Absolutely. Uh, so, little tip of the cap to Bree here who can't be with us. Who or what is more likely? Rob Gronkowski is a Denver Bronco in 2023 or Michael Thomas is a Denver Bronco in 2023. All right. I'll make this short and sweet. Rob Gronkowski. And the reason why is because it's already been thrown out there from the coach's mouth. What else do I need? (laughs) Michael Thomas has been like, he kind of fits a similar role to what the Broncos have. I am going Rob Gronkowski all day. We've seen it. Super Bowl. We saw it before the Super Bowl. The Gronkos. It's Rob Kronkowski. It's an obvious answer for me. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, there was the weird drama between Michael Thomas and Sean Payton a bit. Uh, and yeah, Gronk. I just it's it's a uh, it's already been thrown out there, which is crazy because Gronk's not in the NFL. Hasn't been for an entire year, and Michael Thomas is an NFL player still. <laughs> so just weird situation. Go away, Gronkos. Go with yours. 
All right. So here's mine, Zach. What is more likely? Caden Stearns proves himself to be a future starting safety for the Broncos, or Damari Mathis proves himself to be a future starter at cornerback for the Broncos. Which of those do you think is um, – which one would you choose? I'm going to go Caden Stearns because he doesn't have the path – or he doesn't have the obstacles in his way, rather. He has the clear path to that starting role. Kareem Jackson's gone. It's just P.J. Locke, and I love P.J. Locke to death, but I think Caden Stearns has the inside track even despite the injury. I don't know if the Broncos are cutting Ronald Darby. Cutting Ronald Darby made sense if you were doing my aggressive rust plan. I don't know if they're going to cut him anymore. Um, and uh, just that question mark makes it that much less likely that Damari Mathis starts. Uh, I'll also throw out this. You know who was a mid-round corner who had like a semi-promising, if not streaky, rookie year and then fell apart in year two? Michael Ojemudia. And I don't think Damari no. Mathis will go that way. But the point is, Corner is a high variance position, much more so than safety. Caden Stearns has proven it at a higher level. He's proven it for longer. The position's less variance. He's got less obstacles. The answer is Caden Stearns. Uh, I disagree. I disagree. I'm going to Mari Mathis. We saw it last year, Zach. And it's a, it, you mentioned that it's an easier obstacle. It's a damn good thing that the Broncos run three corners. That's what my take is. Uh, <laughs> I think that the Broncos – Damari Mathis will play next year. He will play, and he will be a productive part of the Broncos' defense. He played last year. We saw it last year. Why wouldn't he progress this year? That's my take. Why would Michael Ogenudia? <laughs> All right. All right. That's our show for today. I hope you guys really enjoyed that. But before we sign out, um, I thought that actually really brought good yeah, conversation, please. too. Um but where can they find your awesome work, Zach? I know you're putting out Buff, CU, Deion Sanders, all the recruiting news. You're looking forward to the spring game coming up. Where, where, but where can they find that content? Yeah, absolutely. Frankie dragging me, your co-host taking your side, unsurprisingly. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, yeah, find all my work at myhighsports.com. I've still got tons of Bronco stuff uh, here on the show and then on Twitter. Um, uh also, uh, please get in our Discord or add us on Twitter or Facebook or YouTube or wherever you're engaging with this uh, show. And um, let us know what you thought of the new game. I think it's fun, and I'd like to bring this back. But if all of you hate it, you know, that would change things. We won't forget that. <laughs> so please communicate with us. That'll be helpful um, for the show. We want to make the best show possible for you all. Um, and then uh, one last little personal thing. I hate to end the show on a downer, but I also uh, want to destigmatize this stuff. Um, uh, text 988 if you're going through a hard time, everybody. Um, that's the national suicide line. Um, uh, it's always hard to ask for help. And, um, you know, I've been there. I've had people close to me that have been there. And it's hard to reach out for help, but um, it, it really does get better. That's a cliche for a reason. I can tell you from experience. I know that's true. I know it's hard to talk about, especially, um, I'm just gonna, you know, Hey, we talk sports right now. I was mostly male for us men in America. It's unfortunately a, a problem. Um, if you ever need to reach out, um, there's people in your life that care about you. I promise. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable reaching out to them, text 988, look up the national suicide number. If you want to talk on the phone, um, there's always resources for you. And uh, yeah, sorry to end it on a downer, but wanted to communicate that. No, absolutely, Zach. I'm happy you brought that up as well. I, I really do. And I know everybody's ecstatic to see you back in here. Um, everybody, Paul, chimes in. Miss you, Zach. Everybody <laughs> missed funny. you. Frankie says, glad to see you back, Zach. Great episode. So awesome. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, Everyone, please follow me at JR Drafts. Find my writing at Mile High Sports. But that's all we really have today. I hope you guys really enjoyed this. Um, Zach being back. Bree will be back. The three of us will all be on here together very, very shortly. But until next time, guys, go Broncos. Let's go.